I want to remind you that uh, ask me questions any time that you want. Uh, just stop me when you, when you get the question. Uh, and there's a glossary in the back if you haven't thumbed back there at the end, because some of the work, I know a lot, a lot of these, this vocabulary may be new to you, and uh, I've picked certain words that are more common and made that glossary in the back. If you remember yesterday, we talked there's two kinds of fungi mainly, two forms, hyphae and yeast, and then there's what we call the dimorphic fungi, which exist in both forms. And also that we temperature varies at, at which these grow, and we always incubate at two temperatures, which is what? 37 and what? 25, room temperature and body temperature. So we're going to start off this morning just talking about the yeast. Now, you remember the iceberg picture? Well, we're just going to talk about the tip of the iceberg with respect to yeast. We're, we're just going to talk about two most common, but there are a lot of species of yeast that cause disease. The yeasts are oval and single budding, uh, single cells, and they reproduce by budding. And during the next couple of hours, I'll be talking to you about some special forms of these yeasts, which uh, are important in certain diseases. Well, I'm going to discuss two genera, the Canada and the uh, Cryptococcus. The Canada, they're the main species is Canada albicans, and then there's a whole other, it's almost a study of its own of the non-albicans yeast. Uh, 25 years ago, we only thought of Canada albicans as causing disease, and now these others are very significant. And what makes them so special, the non-albicans, is, is their drug resistance. And that's a big problem. It's endogenous. That means it's within the body. The... Um, various surveys that they've done years ago which show anywhere from 40 to 80 percent of human beings contain Canada albicans in the gut. It's normal flora. Uh, and they may be uh, in the mouth, in the gut itself, or in the vagina. It's a very, it's a leading cause, cause of va uh, vaginitis. Uh, since it's in the gut and, and almost all the population, why does it cause disease sometimes? Well, it causes disease when there's some alteration in either the cellular immunity, when the individual uh, has some defect in immunity, including AIDS. Uh, if there's a disruption in the normal flora, prolonged antibiotic use, that's why Many women, when they have vaginitis and they're treated with an antibiotic, uh, if they're treated too long, uh, then the, it knocks out the normal flora that keep Canada in check, and the same thing happens in the gut. And then the Canada albicans takes over and starts causing disease. And then the other is in uh, uh, alteration of physiology. And whether it's putting in a heart valve or primarily indwelling catheters. If there's an indwelling catheter in the patient, you can't eradicate the um, Canada albicans without having um, uh, removed the catheter because the catheter keeps seeding the uh, infection. And if you remember yesterday, I tried to emphasize you've got to distinguish between colonization and infection. And if 40 to 80 percent of the people have the organism and uh, they're normal, that's colonization. So you're not going to try to treat that. And you've got to determine that this is actually causing an infection. Uh, it can infect any organ, really, almost all the fungi. I'm going to be telling you about their predilection for certain organs, but it doesn't mean you're not going to find them somewhere else. There's always a case report of this or that or the other where they cause infection. But where we see cannabis primarily 
is uh, skin, vaginitis, urinary tract, mucous membranes, septicemias with any indwelling catheters, and endocarditis and pneumonia. Pneumonia is not common, but it can occur. Um, in the skin, you'll frequently see this like in dishwashers, where their hands are always in water. I guess there's, I don't know, probably restaurants don't have dishwashers or put their hands in water much anymore. They're all in uh, machines, dishwashing machines. But that's where it was common, and they'll get infections around the, the uh, nail bed called peronychia. And very often these, they'll either be staphylococci or Canada. This is a Canada lesion oral. Here the trunk tongue is retracted, and here's a retraction of the lower lip, and, and these are the plaques. Uh, it often gets the scalp in children. You'll notice that newborn, that is, newborn children, that they'll have a, a cap on them, and that, that usually helps to prevent the uh, Canada infections. And then many times a dentist will pick this up in the mouth when they're working on a patient and see these Canada lesions. The fourth most common nosocomial bloodstream. In fact, it's um, Canada and two others we're going to talk about, mucor and aspergillus, are the leading causes of uh, hospital infections. Just to give you an idea, these uh, 20 years in here, 12, whatever they are, uh, the increase and, and these years when we started using lots of antibiotics and getting into surgery that invaded uh, various tissues and the uh, hospital infections just went up tremendously. They are worldwide. As I told you, we'll be discussing some endemic organisms, uh, so I'm emphasizing where they occur. These occur anywhere. What do you send to the lab? Well, you send to the lab whatever, however the disease is presenting, and you send the appropriate specimens. The lab will uh, grow them on a special agar. It grows on regular bacterial medium, but to get really identification, they'll transfer it to a special agar. And then we look for things. Uh, we look for these uh, conidia they produce, and we look for these um, it's called pseudomycelium. It looks like hyphae, but it isn't. What it is is an elongated, this is an elongated bud. And it stops and then produces another elongated bud. And they produce these structures that help in identifying the species. So a nice little clever thing they do is they form what we call germ tubes. It's not a great picture, but these are the yeast. And if we incubate them with something like uh, serum, or you can buy some commercially prepared fluids, like a half an ml, you inoculate it with the organism, and you incubate it for two, three, four hours. And the yeast cells will grow out this is called a germ tube. That's important for identifying uh, the Canada albicans, that's the only other species that, that produces these uh, germ tubes. Serology, people have been, for 30, 40 years, been given examples that say, I developed a serological test for Canada. None of them really work very well. Uh, the beta-glucan measurement is showing some promise, but it's more or less used by investigators and not readily available to the uh, uh, practicing physician. Nystatin, that stands for New York State, because it was de developed in the public health lab in New York in the uh, late 1940s, uh, is used for vaginitis and cutaneous. That's about all. Fluconazole is probably the drug of choice now, and itraconazole is used. These azoles have uh, proven very wonderful in mycotic diseases, but 
none of them take care of mycoses in general. They all have a separate, a special niche that they turn out to be good for. In the beginning, they treat everything, and then they find out there's relapses in a lot. But uh, fluconazole and intraconazole uh, are used. Fluconazole most, uh, is the most common. Okay, that, uh, that's a nice picture, isn't it? Um, that, that's all on Canada, okay? Then the next one is cryptococcus. This is an important organism. A subacute or chronic infection, which may infect the lungs or skin, but most commonly it's caused by, it causes um, encephalitis. You get it by inhalation <coughs> or inoculation. <clears throat> inoculation is very rare. And inhalation has never been proven, but it's the only way that we could possibly um, figure out that people get it. I'll tell you a couple of stories as we go along to emphasize that. Again, this organism is worldwide. The typical clinical course, the person inhales it, <clears throat> and they may have, may have a mild pneumonia. They may not even recognize that the patient. You've got to get this history from the patient. And what happens, we think, is that they inhale it, and it takes months, two, three months, then the organism starts to settle down and get established. And what the person first tells you is they have problems with their vision. And then they develop lethargy, and then they get a headache. And this will go on, this is like a six-month period of time. It's not, not real quick. Then delirium, nuchal rigidity, coma, and death. Uh, and death is 100 percent if not treated. The organism is spherical, a, a fair size, good size yeast, 5 to 10 microns. It has a narrow base, and this is the important part I expect you to remember, is that I'm getting the wrong. I haven't developed the new thumb that you need for cell phones and everything else. Uh, surrounded by a polysaccharide capsule, and you'll see that picture in your handout. The center part is the yeast cell, and the outer part is the uh, capsule. Uh, here, see this center part is the yeast cell, and this is its polysaccharide capsule. There's a budding yeast, and you see the capsule is around the budding yeast. This is what we call an India ink preparation. It's one of the ways we use for years and still use a good bit. You take a drop of spinal fluid and you mix it with uh, India ink, a drop of India ink preparation. That's, it's a diluted India ink. And it shows these capsules. It just outlines the capsules like that. Now, the capsule is believed to be a um, virulence factor. Again, not proven. We know it has uh, melanin. It produces melanin because these colonies will turn brown uh, after you let them age, let's say, two or three weeks. They'll turn brown. And then there are many, many species of cryptococci, but none of them grow at 37. The uh, Cryptococcus neoformans will grow at 37 degrees. Where do we find it? Uh, it's worldwide, but it's very common in chicken droppings and pigeon droppings. Now, what I'm going to be telling you about, particularly with the dimorphic, are these different outbreaks we have of disease. We don't get them with Cryptococcus, and yet it's very similar to the dimorphic endemic fungi. Uh, if you're not aware, Richland Memorial Hospital is fairly new. There are a bunch of county buildings on, uh, where are they? Red brick buildings. Gene, help me out. No, down at the, that's where the old hospital used to be, the old Richland Memorial Hospital. Uh, where, what's Benedict? What, what's the road Benedict's on? Harden. Harden. 
and uh, Gervais, I guess it is. All those big red buildings, that was the old Richland Memorial Hospital. They were tearing that down, and we, when we found out that they had tons in the attic of pigeon droppings, and you'll find this a lot of, all over the state, and they were shoveling all this stuff out and inhaling all these dust. We followed these workers. I think there must have been about 18 or 20 for well over a year, both physically and uh, serologically, and not one of them developed disease. And yet we know that that has to be the way it's getting around. Uh, chicken droppings are loaded with them. We used to get calls all over to go and look at them. Just to give you an idea, 65% of the sites we examined had cryptococcus. And this is the lethal form of the organism, because we identified it as species. 45% of all the samples we took. And, of course, we identified them with this India ink preparation. To show you the capsule, this is tissue. It's hard to recognize, but it is lung. But you see the organisms? And you see the capsule forms in the tissue itself. And in the brain, this goes into the brain, and the people die because of uh, intracranial pressure. The organism just occupies space. It develops with the capsule and occupies space and, and crushes the brain, more or less. Of course, spinal fluid. This is the majority of cases uh, you'll see. 80 and 90 percent are going to be spinal fluid. Uh, we send to the lab accordingly. Uh, for some reason, again, unknown, many patients will have the cryptococci in the urine. So a urine sample is good to uh, see this um, organism. And I have biopsy material because in the recent years, let's say the recent 25 years, uh, we're seeing uh, cryptococcus as a uh, indolent lesion on the uh, skin, legs, arms. It's a creamy colony. It grows out 24, 48 hours, more or less. And uh, it's like a bacterial colony, very soft, creamy. And it's uh, slimy. If you have it in a test tube, due to the capsule, if you have it in a test tube, after a week or two, it starts running right down the tube. Uh, this is lung tissue. There's the organism. Histopathology. You see, there's the organism, and that's the capsule around it. Organism, capsule around it. Um, I, Okay, here's a longer Han cell or a, a giant cell. These are the giant cell nuclei, the lighter staining cells. The very dark stains are the cryptococcus yeast. It's a granulomatous reaction, histologically. We have a couple of tests. The indirect fluorescent antibody, it's like I showed you the fluorescent antibody the other day, except it's indirect because you have a known antigen you put on the slide, and then you put the patient's serum, and if they react, uh, it fluoresces. Uh, a tube agglutination that's not used very much. The most important is the latex agglutination test. It measures antigen, and this can be used either on the serum or on the spinal fluid. And the uh, spinal fluid will have uh, the characteristics of, has Dr. Bryan talked to you about uh, um, meningitis in general? Or, yeah? Oh, next week, okay. And there's different patterns in the spinal fluid. Anyway, cryptococcus, you have a lowering of the glucose and a raising of the opening pressure when you uh, do the spinal tap, and then a um, uh, increase in protein. To keep it in my mind, I like to think the organisms are eating up the glucose. That's why it goes low. That's, just, that's their food, and then they're excreting the protein. By the way, the latex agglutination test, uh, particularly in the spinal fluid, if the patient's getting worse, the uh, titer increases. 
more organisms which are antigen, so the titer increases. As the patient's responding to therapy, then the uh, titer begins to decrease. So you can follow your patient periodically with the latex glutamation test. And um, it's used often now in place of the Indy ink test because you could put it right onto the initial spinal fluid and get an antigen reaction and report that back to the uh, physician. That's an indirect fluorescent antibody. It's a yeast budding single bud with a narrow base. Uh, to give you idea of the, um, th this is the antibody. This is the way a patient goes. Here's in time when the therapy is initiated. And this is the antigen. And as the antigen, after therapy, then the patient's responding, antigen decreases. And as the antigen decreases, it, uh, the antibody returns. And this is thought because simply in this period, the antigen is tying up the antibody, and that's why you can't measure it. Um, I, I think I have a typo in your notes there. Uh, Amphotericin B plus 5-flucytosine and Amphotericin B plus fluconazole. I think of the second part of your notes somewhere. I, I, I think I put flucytosine twice, so if you'd correct that. Anyway, it takes two drugs. The Amphotericin goes in there and makes the cell wall permeable, and then the 5-fluconazole uh, is the... Uh, next agent that maintains it. And what's nice is amphotericin B, if you remember, requires hospitalization and long-term therapy, but the uh, others are oral drugs. So you wean the patient off the fluconazole after you get control of the disease, I mean, a off the amphotericin B. Wean them off amphotericin B and continue with the oral medication. In AIDS patients, that oral medication goes on for the rest of their life. 